morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the, the first meeting of the SCPA in 2015. And I would uh, just remind everybody to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices. Um, do we have any apologies? Alex Johnson. First item on the agenda is the decision to take business in private. Uh, so we decided to take agenda items 3, 4 and 5 in private and whether to consider our work programme in private at our next meeting. Are members content? In that case, our next item on the agenda today is to consider Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts for 2014-15. And I'll welcome uh, to this meeting Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, John McLean, Chair of Audit Scotland, Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General, and Diane McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer. And I believe either Caroline or John are going to do an opening statement. Yes, Convener. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, make a brief opening statement. Um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed and found interesting reading in our annual report and accounts which describe Audit Scotland's work and the financial outcomes over the past year. As you know, our job is to help ensure that public money is spent properly and effectively on the wide range of public services that are provided in Scotland. It is an important task. We audit 184 public bodies from the smallest council or health board to the Scottish Government itself, involving total annual expenditure of more than £40 billion. We also publish a wide range of reports that seek to provide assurance that this money is well spent and, hi and that highlights areas for improvement. The annual report demonstrates the strong foundations of the Scottish public audit model. Nonetheless, we always need to be agile in responding to changing needs and conditions. For example, in areas such as new devolved powers, the integration of health and social work, restructured police and fire services and more intensive audits for the European agricultural funds. Currently and for the foreseeable future, all of this is set against a, back, a backdrop of even scarcer financial resources and rising demands underlying the need for better longer term financial planning across the public sector. Included in this is the continuous requirement for Audit Scotland itself to strive for the highest standards. I took over as board chair last October, succeeding Ronnie Cleland, who made an immense contribution over five years and led the organisation through periods of substantial change. We were also pleased, pleased to welcome to the board two new independent non-executive directors, or members rather, Ian Leach and Heather Logan, who have brought fresh insights to our work and who have each chaired one of the two board committees. And as you know, Ian will succeed me as chair in October this year. Finally, I'd like to pay tribute to the staff of Audit Scotland for their commitment and the quality of their work, as is amply evident from the annual report itself. It has been my pleasure to work with them over the past six years. Thank you. Um, I think we'll move straight to questions. Um, one thing which really stands out in the report, over the last few years we've talked about performance measurement and efficiencies and, and so forth. I'm not seeing that in the an, anything in the annual report or in anything that's come forward. How are you measuring your performance? Before we deal with that, Caroline was going to make a few introductory remarks as well. Do you want her to do that now? No, by all means. Is that I'm happy to move straight to questions if that works, no. Convener. Thank you. I'm sure you'll cover the ground, but we're, we're wanting to through your questions, and it's your time to use. Thanks, John. Um, Convener, you asked about um, performance measures and efficiency. Um, we've included some high-level performance measures here in our annual report, as we normally do, um, and I hope that together with the pattern of efficiency savings that we've achieved over the last four years, they give you that high-level picture that we've maintained and in many cases improved our performance while reducing the cost of order over 20 years. As you would expect, though, underpinning that, we have a much more detailed system of performance management within the organisation that focuses on performance measures that are monitored by the management team and by the board quarterly to make sure that we're on track to maintain the volume of activity that we're committed to, the quality of it, and the improvement um, projects that we have underway. Diane McGiffin would be well placed to tell you more about how that works in practice, if you'd like a bit more detail about it this morning. 
I think it would be useful because uh, the Commission has raised this on a number of occasions and uh, it, it's obviously been a concern for members. Um, <clears throat> the annual report reports on the final year of the four-year plan to reduce the cost of audit um, over four years by 20% um, and um, we're pleased to report that we achieved that. That was largely achieved by um, reducing the um, numbers of staff that we have employed and we've done quite a bit of restructuring over the past five years and we also um, retendered for the um, work that we contract out to private audit um, firms to deliver and we have passed those savings on to audited bodies in the form of um, reduced charges for audit so over the four year period you'd be able to see um, a real fall in the cost of audit and a real fall in the um, numbers of staff that we have. I think, I think the performance measurements you're talking about here relate to purely financial, but there's obviously broader measures, and I wondered how you <laughs> capture these. So we capture them in a number of ways. Um, we have um, efficiency performance measures within the business which get reported to the board on a quarterly basis. Those will look at um, the um, average costs that we're running for delivering projects, the time taken to deliver projects, the, um, the ways in which we're using colleagues and the available resources we have. Um, they'll look at the activity during the period and the outputs delivered during the period. So that's an ongoing um, reporting to our board um, on those things. Those are um, our financial performance is um, examined every quarter by the audit committee of the board and the board then um, considers in detail the business performance and the wider issues um, and that covers a whole spectrum of things including the ways in which in which we're restructuring um, our vacancy levels our turnover levels uh, making sure that we're resourced to do the work we need to do but that we're doing that in, a, in as efficient a way as possible um, there's a report that we produce alongside the annual report which covers um, the impact that we make, the wider impact that the work has and you'll see in that report examples of the ways in which the work of our audit teams has helped to improve public services. So we have internal performance and efficiency measures and we also try to capture in quite a rich picture the impact that our audit work has um, through, the, um, through our engagement with audited bodies. I think it would be of interest to the Commission to see some of these performance measurements that you're, that you're extracting, um, given the interest that's been expressed yep. in the past. Very happy to share, uh, to share those with the, uh, with the committee and very happy to, um, to discuss them in, in, a, in any forum with you. Thank you. Um, just turn to questions. In, in page 10 of the annual report, uh, it states that the auditors completed 98% of the audits of health, central government, further education and local authorities on time. They're clear that's, that's the majority of the work. But it does mean that four of the 184 bodies were not completed the timetable. Um, can you advise why they weren't completed the timetable? And was there any common reason across the four why that happened? Or was it just individual issues? I'll ask Russell to pick that up as the person within Audit Scotland who oversees the quality and the timeliness of the audit reporting. They were, in this instance, they were individual issues. Uh, largely, they were ones where the accounts were presented, either presented late for audit in the first place or required significant further work, which took the agreement of the adjustments required beyond the uh, the deadline for completing the audit or the target for completing the audit. So the information provided to you was not adequate yes. in these four cases? Yeah. Which cases were they? Uh, certainly the first year of the uh, Scottish Police Authority was one of them and Orkney Health Board was uh, another one. Um, in the case, yeah. uh, in, in the case of the, the health board, I th if I remember rightly, the accounts were finally signed off only a few days after the target date of the end of June last year. What was the problem with the accounts? Uh, capital accounting, the um, 
revaluations had not been put through correctly and it needed uh, an extensive amount of administrative work by the board to get all the figures uh, correct. Okay. Seems pretty basic, don't they have an account? <laughs> Convener, you and Mr Martin might recall that I brought Section 22 reports on both the SPA and Orkney Health Board to the committee last year um, reflecting problems which included the difficulties they had in preparing their accounts to the agreed timetable um, as well as some other um, financial management and internal controls issues. Who, who were the other two? I was going to chip in to say I think one is Coatbridge College where there's a Section 22 report waiting to be laid at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if I know what the fourth one is at the moment, but we can certainly come back to you with that information. Thank you. And it, so in, it, definitely there wasn't any common reason across it. Was, it was individual issues with these individual bodies. That's right. Probably right. worth letting the um, Commission know that um, over a long period of time it's been a real focus of both the Accounts Commission and myself and my predecessor as Auditor General to really improve the timeliness of um, financial reporting and audit reporting. Um, in the past there was a, quite a strong pattern of accounts being completed late, the audits being completed late and obviously the more that's the case the less useful the information is both to the body itself but importantly to the Parliament and others with an interest. Um, so it is generally a very small number and it almost always reflects problems in the particular body rather than a wider pattern of problems either with the accounting or with the auditing of them. Thank you. Paul? I refer the panel to page 13 of the annual report uh, and particularly what it refers to it notes that the work on the police reform in Scotland has found that urgent work was required in the financial strategy for achieving 1.1 billion uh, of savings expected from restructuring. Now, given that Police Scotland have now moved to the one uh, structure rather than the eight previous structures that we've seen previously, I wonder if the Auditor General could advise us what expected savings will be made in respect to the audit fee. Um, we referred to the Scottish Police Authority in response to the convener's question a moment ago um, and I think it's fair to say that for the SPA we haven't seen the reduction in the audit fees yet that we, we expected to see at the time reform was underway because of the slow progress the authority itself is making um, in financial management and in bringing together its financial systems. Um, when I reported to the PAC last autumn um, through a section 22 report they were still at that stage I think operating eight separate financial systems and my report drew attention to problems with their internal controls and governance. All that means that the audit fee is larger than it otherwise would be. Um, we had expected, and Russell will keep me right on this, um, that the audit fee for the new single force would probably be around half of the total audit fee for the predecessor authorities. We still have that aspiration, but it does depend on the authority being able to make the uh, efficiency savings itself in bringing its systems together and getting good systems of governance and control in place which we haven't yet seen. What kind of time scale do you think would be attached to that in terms of where you would want to be in that position? Very hard to say at this stage. Um, I had a briefing from the auditor of the authority quite recently about the progress of this year's audit and there are still some issues um, which may result in a report to the committee in due course later this year. Um, but for as long as that continues the audit fee will need to be larger to reflect it. Very happy to keep the committee up to date through our budget submission later this year um, but I'm very clear that I can't it wouldn't be proper to reduce the audit fee until that is justified by improvements in the governance and financial management within the authority itself. Okay, can I move you on to page 26 of the report? Uh, <coughs> it says that Audit Scotland notes that the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman has upheld uh, one complaint against us. I just wonder if we could uh, have some further information on, on that complaint. Absolutely. We're obviously disappointed to have found ourselves in that position. Diane can tell you more about the complaint itself. Um, thank you. The um, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman upheld a complaint from a member of the public on the way that we as Audit Scotland had handled uh, the complainant's request for us to investigate another public body. Um, the, um, the Public Services Ombudsman upheld it um, upheld the complaint after originally not upholding it, so had revisited um, the complaint 
and we've taken on board um, the findings of the SPSO. He has reported them in public and we've recorded um, them in our annual report. And um, we've apologised to the, um, the person concerned. We didn't, um, we didn't do well enough in that case and we've used it as an opportunity to improve our handling um, of correspondence and concerns. So, are you able to be specific about the actual complaint? You know, and also when you say you've learned lessons from it, what exactly those processes are? Um, the lessons are um, about um, the allocation of resources to um, complex complaints. The, um, the, I think we in this particular case didn't do well enough in keeping the complainant informed about the progress of the complaint and our handling of it. Um, and that was because I think from the perspective of colleagues handling the complaint, there wasn't much to add, but the, um, that's not really good enough in terms of keeping communication flowing. And um, we've learned lessons about how we internally keep different teams informed um, about the, um, the process of handling complaints. So a lot of, um, a lot of process handling issues which this um, case has helped us um, follow from beginning to end where we could do better. I think our handling of correspondence and uh, complaints which we flag in the report is an area over the past year where we've sought to improve overall and the finding by the SPSO was a disappointment um, to us and one that we've apologised for and sought to learn from, but we didn't do well enough. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, can we have good morning, everyone. Um, on page 27 of the annual report, uh, it notes in the final paragraph that most internal audits in 2014-15 achieved substantial assurance uh, the highest standard available from our internal auditors, uh, TIA, is that the, or TIA, TIA. Um, a, a follow-up report showed that uh, we were making excellent progress in applying previous recommendations. Can you confirm which uh, internal audits didn't achieve um, substantial assurance uh, and advise us of the, the level of assurance that was given by internal auditors? Of course. Diane, could you pick that up? Um, only one report didn't achieve substantial assurance and it was a review into our readiness to um, seek accreditation um, for information for a, a, an information security standard. The audit was planned as part of a stage process as we implemented and worked towards the standard. The audit was planned as an um, a, a opportunity to stock take how we were doing and the audit provided limited assurance about our readiness to seek accreditation. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, um, about the audit and about the findings and how we would use them. A key issue for us there is that an, a, a big aspect of the accreditation we're seeking is specific to the properties in which you are located and as we're relocating there's a need for us to rework all of our documentation to reflect the relocation in um, autumn this year so we're using the report um, as planned to inform improvements that we need to make and we'll be seeking to go for accreditation um, by the end of March 2015. Um, it's a it's uh, an audit looking at our readiness <coughs> for something and we'd planned the audit to help us um, focus our attention on the areas we need to improve. Okay, thank you. Could, just for the interest of, of members, what does TIAA stand for? Do you know? I really don't know. <laughs> and the, it changed in the course of the year. Do you know? No. I think, it's, I, I think it, means, it means something to the, the team. I don't know if it's an acronym or not. It's not a, it's not a misprint, is it? No. <laughs> and it is lowercase and, um, yep. Yes, I find it odd that it's a, it, it is lowercase and that would imply it's not an acronym. I don't know. Yep. We, we use it as, as the name under which they trade. Um, but I, I think you're right. None of us knows what the initials stand for. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, John. Good morning. Uh, on page 32 of your uh, report, uh, you've reported an, an underspend of 
uh, over a million pounds and this represents approximately 4% of the Audit Scotland's total resource requirement and 14% of the direct funding approved by the Scottish Parliament in the year. And when you consider that uh, most of these underspends may have came from you know, government funding and indeed from local authorities, uh, could you maybe give me a breakdown on what actual underspends have came from Scottish Government and from local authorities? Sure. Local um, government. It might be helpful, first of all, Mr Pentland, if I break down the big areas where um, the underspend occurred, and they come from three broad headings, and then ask Russell to pick up the question of the way that, that falls across the different sectors that we, we audit. Um, first of all, of the um, overall figure, um, a large chunk of about 200,000 came from the pension adjustments that were required to make under IAS 19. So 200,000 is simply an accounting adjustment for the way in which the pensions are accounted for. Um, the other elements of the underspend, if you break them down by um, the expenditure category, are first of all fee income being higher than we budgeted for. Um, we've talked to the Commission here before about the way our fee budgeting works, with an indicative fee that's set for each body based on the assumption that they have good um, governance and good in internal controls in place, but with freedom for the auditor and the audited body to agree a fee up, up to plus or minus 10% around that figure. And we found last year that fee income actually was agreed in total across the piece of about 485,000 extra. So that's a big contrib contributor to the underspend that you're seeing there in net terms. And the other figure that made a significant contribution is the legal, professional and consultancy fees, which came in at just over £200,000 underspent. They're the big areas. We can allocate them across sectors, and I'll ask Russell to pick them up, but I thought it might be useful to give you that, that breakdown by expenditure category first. Russell, can you shine a bit more light yep. on that for us? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I would just add that the third um, significant area within the overall million was 200,000 approximately on the pension adjustments that are made at the end of the year, which are entirely notional um, amounts. Um, they came through the AMI uh, adjustment that we uh, sought at the spring budget revision uh, and therefore go straight back to the uh, consolidated fund in, in, in underspend from that. In terms of uh, the allocation between sectors, we do uh, a detailed allocation of uh, all our costs between the various sectors, so local government, NHS, central government, uh, further education and the activities funded directly by the consolidated fund funding. As you can appreciate, those include a lot of apportionments of some of the central costs where it doesn't directly relate to activity, so it has to be uh, apportioned, um, whereas direct costs such as staff and um, payments to firms can be very easily uh, allocated to sectors. We do that at the, at the budget stage and then we have done it again at the outturn stage. So for local government, um, our overall income was uh, 11 and a half million and our expenditure was 11.45 million. So the difference there is only 58,000. For the NHS, we uh, had income of 3.8 million and expenditure an outturn basis of 3.5 million. So there is uh, an underspend there. So we have in that sector recovered more income than we incurred expenditure. So one of the considerations for the board in August will be whether or not to make an application for the autumn budget revision to provide for that to be refunded to the NHS. Um, in previous years, we have done that on some occasions where the amounts have been significant, but not on others where they are um, fairly low. Uh, in central government chargeable activity, we had income of 2.3 million and expenditure of 2.8. So on that one, we incurred more expenditure than income. Uh, and then the balance is in the consolidated fund funded expenditure. Okay. 
which probably bring me on to my second bit. You did say that, you know, obviously in August, sorry, maybe later on this year, you're going to be thinking about a, a, a mechanism, a timetable for returning the, 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 uh, the underspends in these authorities. Why did that not happen in the past then? You know, when you consider that, you know, these same authorities have been under extreme financial pressures. I think the brief answer is that on occasion it has happened in the past, Mr Pentland. The legislation that governs our um, finances within the um, Public Finance Act um, provides that we must break even taking one uh, class of audits with another, um, taking one year with another. Um, so we uh, are looking to smooth our expenditure across each sector and as far as possible across bodies each year to give people predictability about their audit fees and also to make sure that it's an efficient system to be operating. Um, Russell was talking about a very small underspend uh, there on local government of about £58,000. If you divide that between the 67 bodies that the Accounts Commission audits in the local government sector, that's less than £1,000 each and I think there's a question about whether it's worthwhile for us to incur the expense of, of processing refunds and for them to um, process the expense of, of banking them um, when actually the next year it's likely that the uh, costs may come out in a slightly different direction. So we're increasing the transparency of the way we budget and report that but we do have and I think it's, it, it's built into the legislation have the flexibility to smooth that over a period. When there's a significant underspend, then past practice has been for the board to agree um, that we apply to you for the um, budget cover to refund that money to the bodies involved. Um, but it is a matter that depends on the extent of the underspend or indeed the overspend in particular bodies and the extent to which that's likely to come out in future years' um, audit work. Okay. Again, uh, you know, when you're looking at the... Uh, you had that underspend of, of over a million pound, but then on the same year you sought a further a resource of 1.7 million pounds to cover additional pension costs. And uh, could you ask us why that was the case? Certainly. Um, as both Russell and I um, said a moment ago, some of the pension adjustments that are required are purely accounting adjustments um, that don't have any, that we'd have no control over and that have no um, direct impact on the income or the expenditure that we manage in the year. Over the period of Audit Scotland's life, um, those adjustments have varied significantly um, from significant credits in our favour, which we've returned to the Scottish Consolidated Funds, to significant movements um, against our finances that are ch charged to us, where we have come back to the SCPA to ask for cover generally from underspends to um, manage them. Um, Russell can give you a bit more detail of what the movements look like in 1415, which is the year here, um, but it, it is something which moves very markedly from one year to another um, um, of, over which we have no control and the way in which we need to ask for budget cover is a reflection of the fact that we are largely a member of the local government superannuation scheme but required to manage our finances under the central government Scottish public financial management model which leads to some tensions there that we um, discuss with you each year. Russell. Yeah, um, thank you. As uh, you, you said we applied for um, additional uh, cover and under Amy rather than Dell for uh, 1.8 million in the spring budget revision. That was to cover what we were expecting to be, based on the actuarial advice we had, uh, the additional non-cash charge we have to make in our income and expenditure account for pension costs over and above the contributions that we routinely make to the fund during the year. That's because the accounting basis for uh, accounting for pensions and the actuarial basis are actually different. When we got the final year-end figures from the actuary, rather than 1.8 million, it was 1.6 million of adjustment, and that's why there's 200,000 underspend in relation to that entirely non-cash element, which then feeds back through into the uh, consolidated fund, in that we would not apply to carry that forward for any reason. But I'm sure you will agree that, you know, to the general public, you know, coming in with an underspend and then, you know, seeking a request. And this was only like some four months before, you know, you actually uh, recorded your underspend. So, you know. I, I, 
completely understand that this is a complex area, um, Mr. Pentland, and I think it's we've tried in the past to separate out in our own reporting and for the Commission the distinction between the pension accounting adjustments, which um, are in a sense are like the weather. We have to respond to what the actuary requires of us. They have no impact on the resources available to us, although they do feed through to the outturn figures in the way that Russell's described and the costs that we manage more generally. Um, of the um, million pound underspend that you referred to, about 800,000 comes from the things that we control. The pension adjustments happen outside that due to things like changes in the discount rate that's applied, changes in the um, valuation of the assets for the local government pension fund, um, and there's very little we can do to manage any of that. We're also not in a position, as you know, to, to carry forward reserves to manage it, as most local authority bodies do. So we try to ring fence that with your agreement separately from the other things that we manage here. On the remaining 800,000, which we've reported here, the million less than 200,000 pension adjustment, we completely agree that we can continue to apply more discipline to that to bring it much more closely to our expenditure matching our income. Um, the two areas in that that we've outlined are the higher fee income, and this summer we're looking at how we put the income budget into our overall budget to minimise the chance of there being more money recovered than we um, need across the year. And the other is the um, legal and professional fees where we're budgeting more tightly every year to bring that underspend down. Um, I would remind you that um, under our uh, financial uh, regime we simply are not allowed to overspend so you will always see a small underspend. The challenge for us is to make that as small as possible while making sure that we're not coming back to you for extra resources every time a small change in our um, cost um, envelope occurs. But you're absolutely right to ask the question. We will continue to apply pressure to it and to make that transparent to you in our budgeting round. Well, I'm sure you do appreciate that, you know, if it's complex, you know, if it's a complex year for those people who work in it, you can fully understand, you know, the, the, how the lay person would, would, would look at this. Uh, on page 33, uh, Audit Scotland have reported that savings were made as, as, a, as a result of reduced use of external consultants and professional service providers, uh, £209,000, and ICT and web development expenditure of £140,000. However, expenditure on these services increased from 2013-14 level by £156,000 and £58,000 respectively. Can you provide some explanation of these savings against budget taking account of the increased expenditure on these services year on year? Um, I think Russell is the man to give us a bit of detail on both of those. Um, as a way of introduction, though, I'd say that what you're seeing in both of those is the, the effect of us trying to budget more tightly. Um, so as the, the budget is coming down and you're seeing an underspend against it, but the pattern of expenditure year on year varies depending on what's required in those particular budget headings. Can you give yes. us some information about the underlying figures, Russell? I can try. Um, Yes, that's absolutely right. As the, as, as the overall uh, ex explanation, in terms of the, the consultancy uh, and external support budget, that the budget has been coming down year on year as we have uh, sought to get the budget closer to what we were spending and indeed revisiting why we were uh, spending or not, or not spending it. So the, the, the answer in, in that respect is we, for the consultancy is we did not achieve the level of spend that we thought we would be achieving, but it was higher than the previous year. An element of that is down to the National Fraud Initiative uh, expenditure of just over £200,000, which occurs every second year. The National Fraud Initiative is an exercise that takes place every second year, and we pay um, the uh, what used to be the Audit Commission uh, to process all the data, and that is a, a lumpy uh, piece of expenditure, just over 200000 every second year. And that is the principal reason why the for the variance year on year. So 
IT, which was the other area you were looking at. Um, the expenditure last year, 14-15, was £58,000 higher than in 2013-14. Um, that was made up of increased software license charges from Microsoft to our, our providers and additional licenses for the software we use to allow our staff to securely log into our systems wherever they find themselves. Um, as part of our overall efficiency push, we're looking for staff to work much more flexibly from our clients' offices, um, from the various Audit Scotland offices that we have, and they have to be able to do that securely. The software that we use for that generates savings in other ways, but it does have a cost in itself, and that was a, a significant part of the increased spend on IT in 14-15 compared to 13-14. Yep, Angus. Thanks, uh, Karina. Um, on page uh, 37, the salaries for three senior staff members are shown to have risen by one salary band from 2013-14 to 2014-15. Uh, now, as we know, the band increases can actually reflect a salary rise of anywhere between a pound and 9,999. Um, so, uh, notwithstanding the fact that um, the Auditor General's salary is a matter for uh, the Scottish Parliamentary Body. Um, can you confirm that uh, the pay awards for senior staff were commensurate uh, with rises elsewhere in Audit Scotland and in the wider public sector? Absolutely, Mr MacDonald. We apply, as you would expect, the Scottish Government's pay policy to our own staff across the piece. Um, we, um, for our main grade staff, um, we um, applied a two-year deal in line with the policy, um, which was uh, a modest one, but was able to flex the payment in ways that our staff valued by uh, making a, a 2% increase in the first year and a freeze the second year. For our um, senior management team staff whose pay is, is governed by the Remuneration Committee, um, the senior pay policy from the Scottish Government was applied um, and the treatment was um, consistent with the policies across the piece. Diane will keep me straight, but I think the pay awards available for senior management team members were smaller um, at, in a percentage terms than they were for main grade staff consistent with the um, pay policies that apply. Is that the case? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, on page 38, um, going back to uh, the issue of uh, the pension fund that was raised earlier, um, we note that a payment of 273,000 was made to uh, the Lothian Pension Fund to secure early access to pension benefits for a, a former senior staff member. Um, now, we know that this individual left Audit Scotland and subsequently joined the Board of Revenue Scotland, uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, this aspect uh, of the report um, perhaps has raised a, a few eyebrows. Um, can you confirm that a robust business case was prepared prior to this payment being made? Absolutely. I'll ask John, um, as chair of the board, to come in in a, mo in a moment, um, but I can give you an absolute assurance that all of the voluntary severances that have been agreed by Audit Scotland this year and in previous years are in line with our voluntary severance policy. Um, it's a policy that complies in all respects with the reports we've published on the way other bodies manage this um, and has been an important part of our ability to reduce our costs by more than 20% over the last four years. Um, in relation to the management team, we've reduced the management team from seven members to five since 2012. Um, that's generated significant recurring savings for us. Um, the, uh, the departure to which you're referring in this year's annual report has generated recurring savings for us of £121,000 with a payback period of 27 months. So it's, it's clear to us that it's value for money and it's also provided us business benefits in having a smaller and tighter management team which is able to get some of the benefits of one organisation working that are um, one of the key ways that we're able to keep on delivering our audit work to the standards that are required while reducing the cost. For each early severance that comes forward, um, there is a robust uh, business case which has to comply with our overall policy. It's considered by the management team, and for those which we consider do represent value for money, it's then considered by the remuneration committee of the board to provide that um, assurance about the, uh, the balance between the immediate costs that we're incurring and the benefits that we will gain in future years. We then report annually to the board to demonstrate 
demonstrate that the savings have been, have been achieved in practice. But I'll ask John perhaps to give you a bit more assurance about the boards and the committee's role in yes, that. I can confirm all of that and also that the, the, full, business, the full case for this um, matter was presented to the Remuneration Committee which considered it in detail and scrutinised every aspect of it and eventually approved the business case as did the board subsequently. So we have no concerns about it, uh, especially bearing in mind the, the restructuring that followed it, which allowed overall savings to be made. Okay, um, just to clarify, um, how much have you saved in uh, uh, reducing the management team from seven to five? Um, we can give you the total figure. The figure I've got available today is the figure from the change that happened in 1415. The previous one happened, I think, in 2013-14 and was reported to you last year. Um, but in, in each case, what we're looking for is a saving which is at least 25% more than the cost of the post. So we're not just taking out the cost of the post, but saving 25% more. We can confirm the, the full uh, saving to you separately if that would be helpful. Okay, yes, it would. Thank you. Could I also just add, convener, um, you mentioned, Mr Macdonald, the appointment of this staff member to the Board of Scotland, uh, sorry, the Board of Revenue Scotland. I think it's important for us to be clear that we have no role in those, those appointment decisions being made by other bodies. Absolutely, there was no suggestion that no. that was the case. Yes, John, please. Uh, page 39. And it's just for clarity, and, and you know, it's just the way I'm kind of on, uh, perhaps reading it, but it's on service contracts, and uh, it's the first paragraph which probably needs a wee bit of clarity on. It says service managers hold appointments which are open ended until they retire. Now, I would assume then that's not a contract, is that right? Absolutely. It's, an, it's normal appoint, employment practice that our people are on an open-ended employment contract um, which um, is terminated when they leave, when they resign or when they retire. Um, if we want to terminate them before that, then we incur a cost um, in the way that we've just been discussing. But, but that's where I want clarity. If you want to terminate it, how, how can you term, terminate if it's not a contract it's an and it's an open-ended appointment? It's a normal employment contract, um, so uh, the, the way in which we would have to do it would be through um, a voluntary severance agreement um, under the terms of the policy that the Board has approved, which applies to all of these. Um, the, 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 the disclosure is required to be clear with you that that is the basis on which all of our staff are employed, so we have a continuing liability unless we um, reach agreement about uh, voluntary severance, voluntary redundancy under the terms of our policy for those departures. Still, I'm still a wee bit unclear here. I mean, my understanding would be if you're a contractor, you're on a contract for one to five years or whatever, right? But an open-ended contract that's, means what? That's the way in which we're re required to describe the standard employment contract that all of our staff are employed under and all of the staff of the Parliament or our local authority would be employed under. The, the alternative is a service contract, which is a one-year contract or a five-year contract or something which has a, a fixed term and comes to end at an agreed point. Ours are open-ended employment contracts in the way that I think you would expect for most public bodies. Yeah, but what you are saying, an, an open-ended contract, if, if, if you decide to terminate that contract, there's a cost involved. Why? I think, I think the word contract might not be helping that. I wonder if Diane can help to explain more clearly what I'm clearly not explaining. I shall try, but I'm not sure I'll see it. The, the heading here is one required, I think, Russell, by um, the accounting standards, and it's, it requires us to disclose whether... whether um, senior managers are on fixed term contracts or other contracts. So the word contract there is required by the accounting standards. Our description of it is designed to, to um, explain that our managers are all on appointments which are open-ended until they retire. They're not a fixed term contract. The, I think the title is perhaps getting in the way here. It, it, it's a requirement under accounting standards. So we have the usual employment contracts. We do have some staff on fixed term contracts and when those expire there is no cost to them expiring. But generally speaking the vast majority of our staff are on um, permanent employment contracts. And those, the, the only way of ending those is um, 
dismissal, um, voluntary exit, redundancy and so on, and those, some of those would incur a cost. I don't know if that's any clearer, though. No, I, I think probably the wording needs, needs to be considered and changed, you know, for, for again, for, 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 for kind of us outside the bubble, you know, kind of fully understand. But, you know, it then goes on to say that early, t early term termination other than through misconduct would result in an individual receiving compensation. And that, to me, is where it becomes a wee bit more complex because if it's, a, a, you know, a, an open-ended appointment, why should there be any, you know, a compensation paid to a, a somebody who was finishing it? If the individual decides to finish it, if they resign and move on or if they retire, then no compensation is payable, obviously, as you would expect. If, however, we um, were to conclude that we didn't need a particular group of staff anymore and to agree voluntary redundancy with them, then they would be entitled to compensation for their loss of office under our voluntary redundancy scheme. But that's the difference which is um, it intended to um, be described there. Um, as Diane says, the heading and the wording um, are what we're required to comply with under the guidance that covers our annual reporting, and I'm sorry if it's not helpful to you, but really what it's trying to explain is that the terms on which our senior managers are employed are the absolutely standard employment contracts that senior managers across the public sector have. There is no difference there at all. Same disclosure as last year, um, but we'll take on board your comments about how we can um, try to bring some clarity to that. But there's no change from last year to this year in this um, in this situation. Just with any more, yeah. we, we with any more detail this year, and that's why we're asking the questions. Okay, uh, just to make a final. Sorry, Paul. So just, just on that point, uh, excuse me, Ignacio, but it's maybe just for clarity and for the record. In terms of how I mean, we've seen some reports presented to the Audit Committee in connection with severance payments, and obviously that's a result of the Auditor General scrutinising those reports eh, or those arrangements, how is the Auditor General eh, audited in that respect? It may be helpful just for the official report. Of course. The um, Commission here appoints our external auditors um, and they look at significant transactions in our accounts in the same way that the auditors I appoint do for public bodies. Um, they have um, reported here as part of the annual report on their conclusions and I think you're taking evidence from them shortly after this session this morning. So if you've got any questions about that, I'm sure they'd be very happy to give you their um, the feedback of their work in this area. I think probably as a footnote to, to the question of the pension payment, I think there's a lot of sensitivity about uh, such payments and uh, such payments to senior staff in particular uh, across the public and private sector, to be honest. So uh, I don't think it's surprising that the, the Commission's focusing on this aspect. And we're very committed to making sure that we apply the same standards of governance ourselves as we expect of the bodies that we audit and very um, happy to give the Commission here any explanations that you would find useful about that. Thank you. Just, just one final question here. Note 5 on page 56 of the annual report sets out the fees and charges paid by the audited bodies for the audit services. On the 30th of October 2014, the Commission asked Audit Scotland to provide details of the fee strategy review referred to in the 2015-16 budget sub submission. And in evidence to the Commission, Russell Frith commented that Audit Scotland was looking at all aspects of fee, set fee setting and charging uh, at every aspect of what is in the fee strategy document. And Mr Frith confirmed that this work will finally be concluded over the early months of next year so that we are in a position to set out clear arrangements for our next audit procurement round which kicks off next autumn and to present our budget next year. That's a quote obviously. Can I have an update on this review? Certainly, Convener. Um, we've taken a number of papers on this topic to the Board since we were with you last autumn. Um, partly, I think, to um, set out for what is a Board with a number of new members the way in which our funding and the fees element of that work in practice, and partly to set out some questions for them to review for the strategy going forward. Um, we have made good progress on that. Um, some key decisions have been made by the Board about, about what the options are that we should be bringing to you as part of our budget submission later this summer um, and we'd be very happy to give you an update on that in detail at that point. Okay. Can I ask if members have any other questions on the 
I've got one or two questions myself um, that I'd like to just uh, nip through with you. On page 33, second paragraph, um, we're talking here about an increased deficit in other finance income caused by increased interest costs on pension liabilities. I think I know what that is, but maybe, maybe you could just uh, walk us through that. I'm going to ask Russell to do that as the man who understands this better than I do. Yeah. Part of the pension accounting is that we have to show through our accounts the movement in the net pension asset or liability relating to the local government scheme. And two of the movements are the... Um, increase in value of the, the fund caused by increase in the value of the assets of the fund and the other is to record uh, a liability or an expense for the interest cost on the, liabil on the liabilities um, and they're required to be disclosed as uh, w within that part of the accounts. So it's, it's, ac it's accounting for the movement in the liability that the net liability, pension liability of Audit Scotland. Okay, just dropping on the same page down to comparison with budget, second paragraph, it says fee income net of sums paid to appointed external audit firms was 488,000 greater than budget as a result of an increase in agreed fees compared to budget. Now, you're saying here there was lower levels of expenses paid to external audit firms but an increase in fees. Perhaps, perhaps you could walk me through that one. Of course, convener. Um, the £488,000 figure there is the same element that I described in answer to Mr Pentland's question earlier as a significant part of the underspend, the net underspend that we saw and have reported here for 2014-15. And it comes from um, the difference between the budget that we set for audit fees across the piece um, which was approved by you last autumn and the individual fees agreed between auditors and audited bodies for uh, the, each of the, the 200 or so audits that were carried out. Um, as you know, within the fee strategy, we set an indicative fee and that feeds into our budget. Auditors and audited bodies then have the freedom to agree a fee which is plus or minus 10% around that. And for a range of reasons during 2014-15, the net effect was £488,000 higher than we'd budgeted for. Part of that um, is due to um, particular issues like the Scottish Police Authority that we touched on earlier. Um, part of it is due to um, bodies that have got smaller problems with parts of their um, governance or their internal controls where more audit work is required. Part is simply where the audited body and the auditor agree that a bit more work would be helpful. Some audit fees come in below the indicative um, amount as well, but the net effect was that £488,000 above the budget that we had for the year. It, it just looks a bit odd, as you can, as you can understand. If you're, paying less, if you're paying less for the audits, why are you charging more to other people? In the face of it, it looks... Uh... I appreciate this is complex, and it takes us time to understand all of the things that affect each other, but it is due to the agreement of higher than indicative fees between the auditor and the audited body. Um, page 55. Uh, I'm looking at the legal and professional fees. There's been a huge increase there. I just wondered... Uh, what specifically that was. Um, Russell, please, yeah. yeah that, that is the impact of the point I was referring to earlier about the uh, cost of the National Fraud Initiative occurring every second year. So it, the costs were incurred during 1415 uh, and they weren't incurred in 1314 and that's the line they, go, they, they fall into. So uh, the cost of the National Fraud Initiative is just over 200,000 each time it takes place, so every second year. Okay. Um, I'm looking at page 58, Intangible Assets. Can you remind me what the intangible assets are? They're software licenses, convener. I think I asked this question before, actually. You did, and I remembered the answer we gave you, which is <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think that's everything. Do members have no other questions? In that case, thank you very much. Yes, Russell. I've been handed uh, an answer to one of your earlier questions. 
um, which was what does TIAA stand for? It uh, apparently stands for the Internal Audit Association. Hmm. You couldn't make it up, could you? Well, thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, I'll just pause for a moment while the, the witnesses change over. Continuing on the same agenda item, I welcome the representatives of Alexander Sloan, the external auditors of Audit Scotland, and we have Andrew McBean, senior partner, and David Jeffcoat, uh, associate. Um, can I invite members to, if they've got any questions, Angus? Uh, convener, um, good morning, gentlemen. Um, the Commission notes that uh, your firm has issued a true and, and fair audit opinion following its work on uh, Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts. Can you confirm that uh, you have received all the necessary information and explanations required uh, by you to form your opinion on the financial statements? Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Yes, I am happy to confirm that we did receive all the information and explanations that were required uh, to undertake our audit for the year ended March uh, 2015. If we could just give a brief overview of the work that we carried out. Um, our firm has been appointed to carry out the external audit uh, of the Accounts of Audit Scotland. We are required to provide an audit opinion uh, on whether the accounts uh, give a true and fair view and whether they have been prepared in accordance uh, with international financial reporting standards uh, as interpreted uh, and adapted by the Financial Reporting Manual and to confirm that it had been properly prepared uh, in accordance with the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000 and directions by Scottish Ministers. We carried out an interim audit uh, in February uh, this year and our final audit work was carried out uh, in May and early June. Uh, our audit was carried out in accordance with international standards on auditing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we received all information and explanations that were required to carry out the work and the audit was completed without uh, any problems or issues. We signed our audit report uh, on the 9th of June 2015. Our audit report is unmodified. Uh, that is, we are satisfied that the accounts do give a true and fair view and there are no significant matters which are required to be brought to the attention of yourselves today or any other readers of the accounts. <laughs> we are also required to prepare a report to management. Uh, the purpose of this letter uh, report is to summarise the key issues arising from our audit, uh, including following up the main audit risks uh, identified at the planning stage, and to report any weaknesses in the accounting systems and internal controls that came to our attention during the course of the audit. I am pleased to report that in the course of our audit work this year, uh, we did not find any weaknesses in the accounting and internal controls. I finally just like to record my thanks to the staff at Audit Scotland uh, and the support staff at the SCPA for their assistance during our audit process this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you and good morning, gentlemen. Can, can I just ask in your report uh, to those charged with governance, and I know this is as required by the international standard in auditing, uh, and in your report to the Audit Committee of Scotland, uh, of Audit Scotland, did you raise any matters that the Commission should be aware of? No, we, we, there were no um, significant issues that we had to uh, arise. We obviously followed through our audit process, looking at the audit risk, examining all the areas uh, of significance, and uh, there were no issues or problems that need to be brought uh, to your attention. Thank you. John? Good morning. Uh, at 4.2 of your report, you refer to your effective working relationship with Audit Scotland's internal auditors. Uh, can you confirm if you place reliance on the work of internal audit, and if so, the extent of this reliance in order 
to avoid duplication of effort and to maximise efficiency for both internal and external auditors? I think what I would say in this area in terms of our audit approach, um, we, did, um, we did not in fact place great reliance on the work of the internal auditors. Um, I think that was because basically when we looked at the situation, the areas that uh, they cover uh, within their internal audit approach isn't always really relevant to the audit of the financial statements. So we do examine their work and look at it. We don't place great reliance uh, on it. Uh, it's usual to know that they've looked at the areas that they have and that, that gives us assurances. But we, we, by saying that we don't place great reliance, that means that we, we don't we want to restrict our tests uh, and uh, therefore we, we carry out uh, detailed testing just to be certain uh, that there are no issues uh, or problems. That may create some additional audit work for us, but it doesn't create any additional uh, audit fees uh, for Audit Scotland. Okay. Thank you. Um, you were present earlier where uh, members were asking uh, for information in connection with the uh, pension payment to the member staff and the, the previous witnesses indicated that uh, you had audited this. Are you satisfied uh, as to the business case and so forth supporting that decision? Yes, I mean, we obviously examine uh, the paper where it's been prepared. Uh, we, we don't draw an opinion on the, on the business case, but we make sure and examine all information uh, is appropriate within the reports. We obviously look at each of the uh, cases uh, that have come up under the voluntary release scheme and we've satisfied that all the calculations uh, have been properly prepared and uh, the information is properly disclosed uh, in the account. So we've carried out our detailed work in that area and have no issues or, or concerns. Thank you. Is there any other matter you'd want to bring to the attention of the Commission? No, I think uh, it was a satisfactory audit process uh, this year. Uh, our management letter uh, confirms that there are no issues or problems. So really probably nothing else to say at this point. Do members have any other questions? In that case, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before we conclude the public part of the meeting, I think we should note that uh, uh, we're about to lose Catherine Ferguson, who's going off to greater things, and maybe just put on record our thanks for our help and support over the, the past few years, really, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as I say, that concludes the public part of the meeting and we now move into private session.